officer and director of physical medicine and rehabilitation uh, department and the zonal lymphatic center. And uh, I invite him to deliver uh, the first speech on changing trends in uh, disability and rehabilitation in today's session. Thank you. Thank you, Sivimar, for your kind introduction. Now, good morning, everybody. Good morning, sir. Good morning. I understand that you had a very brainstorming session yesterday, and probably you may have recovered from the shock of yesterday's presentation. And today you are very free to listen to me and my talk. Okay, so my talk will be structured as four or six modules. And this modules will be like this. The first one will be general guidelines in the prosthetics and orthotics prescription and also therapy prescription. Then the second module will be role of physiatry in piano as well as therapy and rehabilitation as a whole. And uh, as a third module, I will uh, describe some statutory acts by which the disabled individuals are taken care of and their, their uh, uh, needs are met by the government. And then I will talk to you uh, on disability certification, what is the importance of disability certification and how this is being done and all. And uh, next will be some information regarding welfare schemes under the state government as well as the uh, uh, Indian government, the welfare measures, welfare schemes introduced by the state. And uh, lastly, I will talk to you something about research and rehabilitation. Probably you may have heard about the research and rehabilitation yesterday. And uh, so I will be only touching superficially about that research aspect in rehabilitation. And, Coming to the general guidelines, see, whenever you prescribe a prosthetics or orthotics or a therapy, there should be a goal for which we are prescribing this service. So that is called a goal-oriented approach. For example, I will give you an example of a patient with a foot drop, a very simple condition, because of weakness of the angle, foot to dorsal flexors, the patient is finding difficulty in walking. And uh, what is the goal in treating such a patient, whether being treated by uh, an orthosis or a therapy, therapeutic exercise, or some drugs, or some surgery, whatever it is, what is the goal? The goal is simply to make the patient walk at a higher speed, as well as to prevent the patient from falling due to skidding against or slipping against some obstacles when he is walking. So that is the goal of treating such a patient. And always the goal should be realistic. Suppose the patient wants to run with the orthosis, that is impossible. Or if he wants to take part in some games, that is impossible with a patient with a foot drop and using an orthotic device or a foot drop split. Then the therapist or the piano technician also should have a realistic goal. For example, the same patient, if, uh, we'll take another example. For example, a patient with vertices weakness, the knee extensor muscle weakness as a result of poliomyelitis or some other condition. So years back, I had an experience. A 23-year-old girl was brought to me with a difficulty in walking, needs heavy support for walking. And the history is like this. Eh? Till some six months back, she was able to walk independently, but with some great deviation. Then she was about to get married and the parents thought of improving her gait pattern. She, she was taken to a hospital where the surgeon has done a lengthening of the Achilles tendon or the heel cord because heel cord contracture was there and uh, probably the surgeon thought that is the reason for the abnormal gait. So she was walking on the toes and uh, the surgery was done. The result was excellent. The heel cord was uh, the, I mean, fully lengthened, but the problem was the patient became unable to walk. 
because the heel code contracts are vast the uh, biomechanical contribution by which the patient was stabilizing her knee and once it is lengthened that stabilization is lost and the patient became uh, unable to walk independently and then she was put on physiotherapy by a therapist and she was undergoing therapy for quadriceps strengthening for 6 months and remember the patient had a absolutely severe absolute severe of power in quadriceps it was a post polio residual paralysis the quadriceps the knee extensor was completely off so how can somebody strengthen something which is not there so that is what i am referring to the therapist the piano technician the doctor the paramedical staff or whoever it is hmm, there should be a realistic realistic goal they should know or one should know what is to be achieved and what is likely to be achieved unless we recognize this issue our treatment will fail and the probably so many problems can including legal issues can arise then the next point is whatever we prescribe it should be need oriented the patient should be able to be patient should be uh, uh, needing it he will he will be uh, using it as a necessary item for example an 18 year old girl presenting with the scoliosis you know the lateral bending of the body and uh, if she goes to a piano uh, expert he will be given with her, i mean by a spinal support or a therapist will do uh, therapeutic exercises to correct the scoliosis but actually does she need it no no she does not need it because the height the growth in height the ends at the age of 18 years by about 17 18 years and after that there won't be any progression of the scoliosis and no spinal jacket and no exercises can correct the scoliosis and it is not required to prevent the progression also so she doesn't need it so we should un- understand what is the need of the patient then another example is a 75 75 year old lady homemaker with abnormal amputation being prescribed a multi axial or a energy storing flex foot and a polycentric or a pneumatic hydraulic knee joint and does she require it no she requires only a basic limb because she is not going to have very high ambulation she is she will be limited to her household with a limited amount of ambulation so there is no reason or rationale in making her spend 1 1 lakh or 1 and 1/2 lakh rupees for a limb which she does not require she require only a basic low cost ak processes then another patient a patient with a severe cardiac compromise a heart related problem and having undergone ak above knee amputation should we go for an ak processes for this patient or should we go for a wheelchair my answer will be we will prefer a wheelchair because even after making a ak processes with the uh, whatever uh, the either modern or conventional whatever it is the patient requires a lot of energy to ambulate and his cardiac condition does not allow this so he will not be able to use the limb so if we prescribe a wheelchair that will be much better for him to make him ambulate or make him mobile then the next point is user acceptance whatever you prescribe whatever therapy or whatever orthosis or processes you are prescribing the patient should be accepting it and this patient acceptance depends on many factors like convenience of use then ease of doing and doping to wearing the processes removing it or or wearing the orthosis and removing it and comfort of using the appliance and also cosmetic concern how it looks to others you see many people especially the youngsters not only youngsters even old people like myself we are all concerned about cosmetic approach that is why we put powder on our face comb our hair we are ironed shut and all because cosmetic concern is important for all of us so this is also important for a person with a disability having to use an orthosis or a prosthesis then lastly most important thing is the biomechanical suitability the patient's problem may be 
as a result of either a deformity or a weakness or a some sort of problem like that and there will be a biomechanic lot of biomechanical issues and if the orthosis or process does not address the biomechanical issues the patient is unlikely to lose it and uh, i am sorry to say that in many appliances quite often the many appliances orthosis processes especially orthosis are supplied by different agencies conducting camps and also government is supplying through the so called sarva shiksha abhiyan and so many other programs are there and i have seen a number of children using getting this orthosis not using them because it is not biomechanically suitable for them or it will be difficult for them to use it so that is also an important factor in user acceptance so here in this picture you see a 40 year old man this picture was taken some 15 years back at that time he was 40 40 years and he is a he is having congenital absence of both upper limbs and a short femur on the right side and a very short femur and leg on the other side and he was moving around in a semi crawling manner so but he was moving fast so he came to the department of pmr in calicut medical college and he was brought by his brother and their demand was to see the patient walking upright without crawling okay so we thought of making a prosthesis for him an extension prosthesis hmm? having a socket and a, a platform for the rudimentary foot and an extension to reach the ground and a long sleeve suspension which will pass over the shoulder hmm? so we are happy the patient is happy brother is happy all are, all are happy and one month later the patient came to me for review but he was again rolling so i asked where is your limb sir i don't use it why because always i need support somebody support because i don't have my upper limbs so i need to call somebody to put it and somebody to remove it after some day then so difficult in doning and doping and again reduce the performance without the limb without the artificial limb patient was moving very fast even though he was crawling semi crawling he was moving very fast but after the prosthesis he became very slow in ambulation and there is lot of discomfort over the interface that is the the socket skin interface so he was getting pain and irritation and all those things and more more important more uh, more than that the weight of the prosthesis was hindering his mobility so he discarded it after one month just one month use so that is why i say you always think of user acceptance before you prescribe any appliance or any therapy or any exercise or any rehabilitation module then other considerations when we apply when we prescribe something is affordability the patient should be able to afford what you are prescribing for example major majority of the indian population you know the indian population is around 188 crores as of now and uh, out of this it is estimated that only 1% of population pay income tax you know the income tax ceiling is 2.5 lakhs per year so that means only 1% of the 188 crore people have a declared income of 2.5 lakhs or more per year that means the 99% are below that no not exactly because there are there are a lot of tax evaders who do not declare the income like this uh, self employed people people engaged in certain professions then the business people they don't declare the income properly so we can estimate that around 9% or 10% are tax evaders so all together it comes to around 10% who are having an income above 2.5 lakhs that includes companies who with a in an income of 9000 plus crore per year and adai is probably having the same type of income and also a government employee who, who is just earning 2.6 lakhs rupees a year all all are included but the 90% of the indian population are below this level even below this level that means they have an average income of probably less than 20000 rupees per month suppose there is only one heading member in a family of four 
That means the 20,000 rupees is just sufficient for the food expense. Hmm? And uh, there are a lot of people, around 21% of Indian population are supposed to be below a uh, very low income group. And around 50% are having middle income group. And they are below, below the middle income group. So it uh, leaves only just uh, some uh, 20, 30 percent people who will be able to afford a costly appliance. So we have to consider this always, always, always when you prescribe something. Suppose you prescribe, suppose I prescribe, I don't say you, I, suppose I prescribe a physiotherapy for 30 days for a patient belonging to this low, very low income group. And the therapist will charge around 300 or 400 rupees. Hmm? Therapist or the institution, whoever it is. And uh, do you think it is possible for them to afford it? Or the same uh, patient with a below knee amputation going for a flex foot, the energy storing, high end profile, high, high profile uh, limb, costing around the two lakhs rupees. Do you think the patient is able to afford it? So the affordability is uh, definitely a big, big, big problem. Then availability of components for continuous maintenance. That is very important. Then there should be provision for post-fitting training. So just fitting an appliance does not make the patient use it properly. So training after fitting. And then again, after sending the patient home, he may come back with some repair or recurring some repair or some replacement. So provision should be there for that also. Then the second part of my talk is role of physiatrist. You know, a, a doctor specialized in physical medicine and rehabilitation is officially designated as physiatrist. And the, the role we can we can summarize the role of physiatrist like this in rehabilitation, disability and rehabilitation. Evaluate the clinical and pathological status of the patient, identify comorbidities and complications of the condition, and manage the patient's condition effectively. But these three points can be done by any doctor. It need not be a physiatrist. But the next two points, few points, they identify the biomechanical issues. I will say a physiatrist is the best person to identify this because he is learning this biomechanical as a major important topic in his or her three year MD curriculum. And a physiatrist also identifies the goal and need for PNDO or therapeutic exercise or any physical modalities. And the follow up of the patient after effective treat uh, regarding the effectiveness of treatment or to suggest any modifications of the treatment program that is to be done by the physiatrist. And in amputations or other corrective surgeries, the physiatrist does the pre operative evaluation. Then the post operative care of the stump is mainly done by the physiatrist. He will advise the patient or the therapist or the caregiver regarding proper stump bandage. That is very important for a proper prosthetic fitting afterwards. Proper stump bandage. Then strengthening of the proximal muscles. That is very important for an effective ambulation because the patient is not going to be ambulant or using these, the amputated side and the muscles will get a disuse atrophy or weakness. And uh, again, there should be provision to maintain the balance and equilibrium of the patient sufficiently so that by the time the prosthesis is ready, the patient will be able to use it effectively. Then again, the physiatrist looks into cardiorespiratory fitness and he advises certain exercises, walking or other measures or some drugs to improve the cardiac or respiratory problems. Then. He also suggests the most suitable orthosis or prosthesis and also makes the checkout and the follow up. Then, I, as, you, as we know, rehabilitation is a teamwork. No member of the team can have an independent practice, independent survival. Hmm? They can survive, of course, but they cannot give the proper attention and management for the disabled population. So these various services are coordinated by the physiatrist. The services like the PNO, physiotherapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, occupational counseling, clinical psychology, rehabilitation, nursing, social and environmental scientists. All these services are coordinated and uh, 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 they supported by the physiatrist. 
that here you see a young girl, probably five or six year old girl, with the lateral bending of the spine. So we call it the scoliosis. You know that scoliosis. If she goes to an or endo expert, he she will be fitted with a spinal jacket. Hmm? Different options are there: Milwaukee jacket or a Boston brace, whatever it is. He she he will she will be fitted with a spinal jacket. Okay. Then she goes to a therapist. He or she will prescribe certain remedial exercises to correct the scoliosis, strengthen the muscles on the opposite side. Okay. But if she comes to a physiatrist, he will just ask the patient to turn around. You see a triangular shaped blackish or brownish mark in the middle of the back. What does it mean? It indicates a tumor. Inside the spinal canal, a neurofibroma, a tumor called a neurofibroma, and that is causing the scoliosis. So, any amount of spinal orthosis or spinal exercises will cure the condition, unless and until you remove the intraspinal tumor. So, the patient will be sent to a neurosurgeon to remove the tumor. After that, we will resort to either spinal jacket or exercise and all. So that is the role of physiatrist. Then here you see a patient with a, a child with a, uh, absent the right upper limb and a gross genu valgum bilaterally and a pest plana valgum of the feet. And uh, on the right side you see the patient is fitted with a AFO, angle foot orthos on both sides to correct the foot deformity and uh, the knee deformity is not corrected by this orthosis for that uh, the patient will occur a knee angle foot orthosis but because of certain other considerations we have confined the orthosis as an air. So is that enough? No. The patient is having, the child is having a condition called rickets which is a result of vitamin D deficiency. Unless we treat the child with the vitamin D, high dose vitamin D, the patient will not improve from the, uh, recover from the deformity. And once the vitamin D is given by injection or uh, oral preparation, and with this advising and all, the patient will, the child will improve dramatically over the next few months. So that is the role of physiatrist. Then now we will come to the uh, certain statutory steps, uh, laws made by the parliament, which will help, which are intended to help the disabled. There are so many laws, but I will confine to three or four laws. One is the PW Persons with Disability Act 1995. The Persons with Disabilities, Equal Opportunities, Protection of Rights and Full Participation Act 1995. This was introduced in the parliament and passed in, 1990, in 1995 and passed by the parliament in 1996. But any act or rule, I mean, any act uh, is known by the year in which it is introduced in the parliament. So, PWD Act 1995 is introduced in parliament in 1995 and passed in 1996. And it envisages certain aspects like uh, equal opportunities to the disabled. It aims to eliminate any type of discrimination and it aims to get the early detection and prevention of disability. And it also aims to effective intervention to reduce, to reduce disability and promote function. Then it also aims to promote education, to provide employment, and also to well, take up welfare measures for the disabled. And also eliminate architectural barriers in all public places and buildings as per this rule, oh, sorry, as per this act. All public places should be disabled friendly, wheelchair friendly. They should do, uh, there should be ramps or lifts in every public buildings, including entertainment halls like cinema halls and all. So wherever a able-bodied man can reach, a disabled also should be able to reach. So that is the architectural aspect of the PWD Act 1995. And also it envisages to provide aids and appliances for the needy. And also it aims to promote rehabilitation in all aspects and also to promote research. And under this act, there are certain provisions designated to implement the various schemes and to act as an appellate authority for persons with a disability. 
there is a chief commission at the national level and also state commissioners in every state. Then there are seven categories of disabilities identified in the PWD Act 1995. They are blindness, low vision, leprosy individuals, hearing impairment, locomotor disability, mental retardation, and mental illness. Then came the National Trust Act 1999. This act, which was introduced and passed in 1999, primarily intended for persons with autism, cerebral palsy, mental retardation, and multiple disabilities. And under this act, so many centers, like our uh, National Institute for Environment, Environment of Persons with the disability, Multiple Disability, or many other uh, institutes have been formed. And uh, through these institutes and uh, through the act, it is aimed to include, to help persons with a disability and their family for home-based care, and to provide help for those who do not have family support, to appoint the guardian in the event of death of parents who are taking care of the disabled individual, to provide assistance to registered organizations working for these persons with a disability, and to help the persons with the disability have maximum functional independence and to avoid all types of discrimination. There are various schemes under this National Trust Act. One is DISA, intended for preschool children up to the age of 10 years for their early intervention and their preschool preparation. Then VIGAS, for children above 10 years to promote education, location, training, and all. Then SAMART, for providing respite to send days or a short stay, short term stay send days for persons who are orphans or having families which are in crisis, to, in, unable to support the disabled. Then Karunda for the group homes for uh, adults. For those who do not have adequate home support, they have to be maintained in the, these special homes lifelong. Then the most important one is the Niramaya. It's a health insurance scheme specifically for persons with a disability with a maximum coverage of 1 lakh rupees per year. Then Sahyogi is there, that is a caregiver training scheme. Then uh, Gyan Prabha, that is in, uh, discontinued, it's an educational support or scholarship for education. Though. This is discontinued. Then Prerna is there, that is a scheme to market the articles produced by the persons with a disability. Then Sambhavi is their scheme to provide aids and appliances. And Bate Kadam, scheme to create awareness and community interaction. And there is the latest news, that is a news in the Hindu in January, on January 15 this year. It is, it says that the COVID code is going to be declared as the first city in the country having enrolled 100% of eligible persons with a disability under the four category, categories under National Trust in Narmaya scheme. So, your code is going to probably, it may have, after that, I don't know what happened, probably, your code is already having 100% registration and, and, uh, in the Narmaya insurance scheme. Then came the PWD, RPW Act in 2016, that is a Rights of Persons with a Disability Act 2016. And this act was introduced based on the UN United Nations Convention on Rights of Patients with a Disability. See, see, any country developing or developed or uh, uh, under uh, uh, non-developed, whatever it is, most of the countries follow the WHO and the UN United Nations pattern for many aspects, especially the disability prevention and the uh, disability management and rehabilitation. India is also part of this convention and uh, based on this convention, the RPWD Act, it is a modification of the PWD Act 1995. It was introduced and passed in 2016. In this act, there is a paradigm shift from the, so originally the PWD Act 1995 was mostly concerned, uh, considering disability as a social welfare issue. Whereas in RPWI 2016, it is being that the, the uh, shift is or the concept is shifted to 
shifted as a human rights issue. So that is a major shift from the original PWD Act. And uh, the RPWD Act stresses on effective participation and inclusion of persons with disability in the society, respecting individual integrity, non-discrimination, acceptance of disabilities as part of human diversity and humanity, ra rather than considering it as an abnormal thing. It is part of the way human variation. See, you may be, I may be five feet, six inches high. My colleague may be six foot, six feet high. And another colleague may be five feet high. All these are variations in the normal anatomy. We cannot say that uh, this person is abnormal, this person is abnormal, or I am abnormal. So similarly, that is the concept of disability also now. Disability, whether it is an absence or limb or a deformity or a, whatever it is, it is part of the uh, usual human diversity and it should be considered as a humanitarian issue rather than a welfare issue or a, uh, some issue which needs empathy and sympathy. Then equality of opportunity and accessibility, uh, accessibility, then it also stresses on equality between men and women. And it also respect, uh, gives respect for the evolving capacities of children with disabilities. For example, uh, I know a, a young girl working as a, as a graphic designer in Arnavalam. She is a bilateral upper limb amputee. She does everything with the lower limbs, with her foot, with her toes. She does every activity in her life. So respect for this changing or this alternative method of performance as normal. You cannot compare it with me or somebody else, but we have to, con we have to consider it as part of normal activities as regards that particular individual is concerned. And uh, respect for right of children with disabilities to preserve their identities. Then, there are 21 areas of disability as per the RPW Act. In PWD Act 1995, there are only seven items. Now they have introduced more items. And they are, these 21 items include blindness, low vision, leprosy, cured versions, hearing impaired, locomotive disabled, dwarfism, intellectual disability, mental illness, autism spectra disorder, cerebral palsy, muscular dystrophy, various chronic neurological conditions, then specific learning disabilities, multiple sclerosis, speech and language disability, thalassemia, hemophilia, sickle cell anemia, all these uh, rheumatological diseases, then multiple disabilities, acid attack, attack victims, and Parkinson's disease. These are the 21 items in this category are included in the RPW Act in 2016. You need not remember all these things, but you just remember there are 21 items in this act. Then, then came an amendment in 2019 to this RPW Act in 2016. And this amendment aims to help those having high support needs. So high support needs is like this. Those requiring intense support, heavy support for their physiological and psychological functioning for activities of daily living, who are unable to take independent and risk-free decisions because of their uh, uh, deficiency in the mental faculty, and also unable to avail the facilities envisaged for the persons with disability. So these are the patients or people who require high support needs. And the state governments, all the state governments should develop dedicated schemes to provide a service to those needing high support, including institutional, long-term institutional care. Then special assessment boards are to be constituted by each, at each district to determine those who need high support. And these assessment of high support needs is based on a high underpoint scoring system considering, considering six parameters. They are the severity of the physical disability, the severity of the activity restriction, and severity of mental and or developmental disability, then cognitive impairment interfering with the safety measures, environmental barriers, and socioeconomic status. And uh, this is uh, the, the certain points are assigned to the, each of these categories and the maximum is 100 point 
and a person who is having a benchmark disability of 40 percent and also who scores a 60 point or above is considered to be someone needing high support. Then we will come to the next part of our talk. That is the social welfare schemes. There are a lot of social welfare schemes envisaged by the national government as well as the various state governments. And uh, I will be describing the few of the important ones. The most important thing, most important one, or most often heard about the one is disability pension. Hmm? Every government is uh, boasting about the increment in the disability pension. Last government gave 100,000 rupees. I gave, I am, our government is giving 1,400 rupees. Last government gave only 500 rupees. We are giving 1,000 rupees. So many claims are there in each government, in each state. And at present in Kerala, the disability pension is 1,000 rupees, rupees 1,500, 1,500, as per an order dated 1-1-21. Uh, it is it is from 1, 1, 1, 20, uh, 2021. Now it is stated that the government is increasing the uh, disability pension to 1,600. Probably still waiting for the order to come. Then there is provision for free supply of assistive devices through handicapped welfare professions, the comprehensive rehabilitation centers, the district disability rehabilitation centers, which are gradually withdrawn from the sea. So, so many NGOs are there, so many other schemes are there, where the free supply of assistive devices, artificial limbs and orthosis are given. And there are schemes for providing free therapeutic services also. Then institutional care for severely disabled. Then there is an employment reservation of 3% in all public institutions, all government institutions and all in institutions funded by the government for public sector undertakings, there is a reservation of 3% for physically disabled individuals. This 3% is set because it is considered that India has a 3% or India's, among the India's population, 3% are physically disabled, having a benchmark disability. So that is why this 3% reservation is opted. And there is also a 3% reservation in education institutions. Then education concession and uh, scholarships are there for children with a disability. And uh, children who are appearing for the public examination, university examination and the world, they are provided extra time for writing the examination for those who are having slow writing or some problem with upper limbs. And uh, those who are not able to write, they are allowed as scribes who will try to cover them in the examination. Then there is a provision for conveyance elements for those in government service. And there is a provision for special casualty for 14 days a year for treating complications of disability. But one thing you have to understand is that this special casualty is only for treating complications arising from the disability. I, when I was in government service, I used to get a number of applications request for special cash leave. The reason my daughter's marriage is there, my housewarming is there, or I want to go to uh, some pilgrimage. These are not reasons for special cash leave. Special cash leave is allowed only for treating complications arising from the primary disability. And uh, there are reserved seats for disabled in public transports like a uh, train. Mm, there is a, a reserved uh, coach, not the entire coach, half of the coach reserved for physically disabled in every passenger train. There is reserved seats in public buses and road. Then there is a travel concession for disabled persons. There is 75% concession for the person, disabled person, and also for the escort, one escort for travel in train. And there is a 50% concession for Air India tickets for blind persons and also for persons with a disability of more than 80%, locomotive disability of more than 80%. And there is 70% concession for journey in KSRTC buses and many other transport, state transport buses are also, the concession is there, I don't know the details, Kerala it is 70% concession. Then government provides the employers 
uh, see many disabled individuals are employed in private sector. So the government provide, provides the employers. Employers, I'm sorry, the government provides the employers' contribution of EPF, the Employees Provident Fund, and the ESI for disabled employees and their institution. And this is for three years. And this is aimed to promote the private sector to employ more disabled individuals. And there are special awards at national and state levels for best performance among the persons with a disability and also for the best employer who employs uh, persons with a disability and also for institutions running institutions for disabled individuals or who are institutions who are employing disabled individuals. Then National Handicapped Finance Corporation provides industry loans for uh, self-employment for persons with a disability. Then there are certain income tax provisions for disabled individuals. Under Section 80U of Indian Income Tax Act, a disabled person can claim a deduction of rupees 75,000 per year, an exemption of 75,000. This is for a 40% or above, a person with a 40% or above disability. And for a person with a severe disability, that is above 80%, there is a provision for exemption of 125,000 or 125,000 from the income tax or taxable income. Then under section 80 DD, there is an exemption to a taxpayer who has a dependent person with a disability. And again, there is 7.5% of petroleum dealership reserved for disabled individuals. Customs duty exemption for specified materials and appliances for the disabled. Then there is provision for low interest loans and subsidies by public sector banks for operators and uh, institutions for disabled. Then under National Rural Livelihood Mission, that's a special purpose uh, project under the Ministry of Rural Development, a provision of 3% of the total beneficiaries have been made for persons with disabilities. So under this National Rural Livelihood Mission, it is, it is planned or it is proposed to grow, uh, to form self-help groups, self-help groups among the poor people. And in the group, there is a mutually supportive system with a financial aid from the government by which the disabled individuals as well as other people in the poor community will be benefited. And these beneficiaries, among these beneficiaries, 3% are reserved for all these benefits are reserved for I mean, 3% of the benefits are reserved for disabled individuals. So, another system, the under Dean Dayal Disabled Rehabilitation Scheme, quite often you may have heard of this DDRS, DDRS, Dean Dayal Disabled Rehabilitation Scheme. Financial assistance is provided to non government agencies, NGOs, for running special schools, occasional training centers, sheltered workshops, community based rehabilitation centers, and the many other projects for persons with a disability. Then coming to the disability boards and certification. At present, all general hospitals, district hospitals and taluk hospitals in Kerala and in many other states, almost all states I think, and in all government medical colleges, there are disability medical boards which meet once or twice a week to show disability certificates. It is mandated and the hospital superintendent is the convener of the medical board and the members include specialists in physical medicine and rehabilitation, orthopedics, ophthalmology, ENT and psychiatry. And also as and when required, there will be special inmates from other departments like neurology, pediatrics, etc. That will permanent members. Then the appellate authority of these medical boards will be the state medical board, which has to be constituted by the directorate, director of health services as and when necessary. And the disability certificates are needed for, to avail all benefits for persons with a disability, including pension, job reservation, educational reservation, all other schemes, this disability certificate is mandatory. And also the disability certificate is needed for claiming, for settling claims under 
మోటార్ యాక్సిడెంట్ క్లెయిమ్స్ ట్రైబ్ ఉన్నది ఎంఎస్ఈకి అండ్ ఓల్సర్ టు సెటిల్ క్లెయిమ్స్ అండర్ వర్క్మెన్స్ కాంపెన్సేషన్ యాక్ట్ దెన్ డిసబిలిటీ అసెస్మెంట్ ఈస్ బేస్డ్ ఆన్ డిఫిషియన్సీ ఆఫ్ ఇన్ మసిల్ వీక్నెస్ జాయింట్ మొబిలిటీ ల్యాక్ ఆఫ్ కోఆర్డినేషన్ ల్యాక్ ఆఫ్ సెన్సేషన్ ఫర్ రెస్ట్రిక్షన్ ఆఫ్ ప్రివెన్షన్ ఆల్ దీస్ ఆస్పెక్ట్స్ ఆర్ కన్సిడర్ సెపరేట్లీ అండ్ యాడ్ then there are certain guidelines issued by the government of india which was included along with the rpw act in 2016 and as per the present guidelines anybody who is having a disability of less than 40% is considered as mild disability and 40 to 79% is considered as moderate disability and any disability having 80% or more is supposed to be severe disability and the 40% is the benchmark disability benchmark disability to be eligible for various schemes for the disabled why this benchmark disability is set as 40% why don't we put it as 30% 20% so that more number of people will be benefited because see the it is estimated that 3% of the indian population are physically disabled hmm? that is when we consider 40% or above and suppose we can include everybody who is having a disability. For example, suppose I lost the tip of my index finger. So I may get a 3 or 4 percent just for missing part of my finger. If we consider people like that also, the entire people, the entire population having some sort of disability, probably the percentage of disabled individuals will come to around 10, 15, 20 percent. So it is not feasible and possible for a government like awards to provide financial help and uh, other welfare schemes for all these individuals so we have put 40% as eligible eligibility or benchmark disability that is to restrict the number of beneficiaries to a reasonable limit then coming to the last part of my talk advances in rehabilitation approach so there may be advances in prosthetics and orthotics advances in therapeutic procedures advances in social support and advances in community integration social participation so what are the advances in prosthetics and orthosis so yesterday uh, our engineer sri kumar was talking me about the recent trends in prosthetics and orthotics and he has discussed the major improvements so i am not going into the details of those things and uh, earlier we used to take a tape measurements or a, a, we used to take the negative mold of the stem and then positive mold and then fabricate now it is changed to 3d scan, scanning of the stem without any any tape measurement or any uh, plaster paris mold or anything like that 3d scanning of the stem and 3d printing by fusion deposition method or some other method 3d printing earlier we used to make first we used to make a, a, a laminated sockets then we used to uh, make this uh, uh, polypropylene sockets then we advanced to the cat cam in the automatic milling machine and all will where we will carve out the process socket from the main block and now it is 3d printing that is deposition gradual deposition to make the 3d uh, the socket and again the control mechanisms like the myoelectric processes and you know that and sri kumar has told to you, uh, talk to you about that so i will talk to you about two things one is targeted muscle reinnervation see any activity in the human body or any animal body is controlled by the brain and this control mechanism or suppose for example i wish or i think of flexing my fingers that impulse is generated in, in in my cerebral cortex in the in the brain and that impulse is signaled or that signal is transmitted through the spinal cord and the nerves to the muscles responsible for my finger flexion so in a fraction of a millisecond it is implemented i think of flexing my finger immediately the fingers are flexing so in a tetraplegic patient the patient who is having spinal cord injury at the neck Hmm? this symbols cannot travel to the hand hmm? isn't it similarly an amputation a patient who is having an amputation hmm? he doesn't have that hand there so the muscles cannot act 
but in an amputee patient, the stump is there, the, the limb stump is there, where some of the muscles are still there. So that uh, the impulses generated in the muscles and the patient thinks of moving certain joints, that impulses reaching the muscle is picked up by the electrodes and that is converted into the control mechanism. That is the myoelectric processes. Hmm? So an advance over this is a targeted muscle reinnervation. Here, this is applicable for a very high amputation, above the above elbow am, uh, uh, amputation for a shoulder disarticulation. See, the stump muscles are not there, stump is, uh, maybe, may, not, may not be even stump is there, but the, the nerves are there, the nerves which were originally going to the upper limb, the elbow, the, uh, the wrist, fingers, the nerves are there. So you identify these nerves, you reroute the nerves to the this area, the front of the upper chest. And there are certain muscles there which are still performing. And you will divide the nerves going to that muscles. And suture the nerves which you have rerouted from the stem to these nerves which are going to the muscles here. So what happens? When the patient thinks of flexing the fingers, the muscle here will contract. But that is picked up by electrodes and that acts as the control mechanism for moving the prosthetic fingers. So that is a targeted muscle re -innervation. And another advance is brain controlled or brain computer interface or brain controlled processes or we call it a neural processes. So there are brain controlled functional electrical stimulation then brain controlled robotic gait orthosis are there for tetraplegics and paraplegics and uh, voice controlled wheelchairs are there and even mind controlled or thought controlled wheelchairs are there. And here, is, here you see a picture where see on the left side you see the electrodes being arranged or placed in the inside the brain. The electrodes are, play, electrodes are placed inside the brain in the area which controls the upper limb function. And from there, the impulses are picked by an external device. And this is, through this, it reaches the forearm, where an array of electrodes are placed on the forearm. And when the person wishes to flex the fingers or extend the wrist or to take something, the impulses generated in the brain is carried to the forearm muscles through these external connections and the result is patient will be patient will be able to extend the wrist see extend the wrist then flex the wrist take something and affect some function so that is called a neural prosthesis it is all these are all under investigation research now probably in future we will get all these things available for common use See, 50 years back, nobody has thought of computer. And 23 years back, nobody has thought of mobile phones. But now we know what we can do with the mobile phones and computers. And even 10 years back, I could not have imagined, imagined about a webinar like this. I am sitting in Calicut and you people are sitting at various places and listening to me. So this has become practical now. Some 23 years or 50 years back, somebody has thought about this but it was not practical. Now it is, it has made practice. So this brain computer processes or neural process will also come into effect in near future. That is what we can expect. Then coming to robotic rehabilitation, robotics in rehabilitation, they are intended to provide a continuous passive motion as well as to promote active and active assisted movements as required. So these robots can be programmed to adjust the amount of assistance or resistance required by the body part. So a patient who does not have much power, he may need assistance to move the limb. A patient who is having some power but wants to improve the power further, so resistance can be given so that further improvement in the power can be obtained. So robots will uh, uh, identify the need and execute the action. And it is used to improve hand function through a strap-on robotic attachment. There are researchers going on. A strap-on attachment by which the fingers can be flexed or extended or something can be taken. Then 
it is also used for augmented feedback. So, see, there is a, 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 a term called biofeedback. So, when, for example, simply when I am having some problem in my hand, I am trying to flex my elbow. So, the elbow flexes to some extent. I am seeing it. So, it is moving. So, I will try to move for more. So, that is a visual biofeedback, self biofeedback. So, the, the presence of this slight movements will encourage my mind to attempt more movement. So, it's a very simple explanation by feedback. So, this uh, robotics can be used to improve augmented feedback as a method of rehabilitation. Then, it is greatly most important the robot is greatly reduces strain on the physiotherapist. See, in a manual physiotherapy, all movements have to be done by the physiotherapist whether it is assisted movement or resisted movement. So he cannot do it for more than for five or six patients effectively. So if he is using a robotics, robot, probably the strain on the therapist is much less and the effectiveness is much more because after one or two patients, the therapist would become fatigued, tired. He cannot perform well. So there is no question of any fatigue for the robot. So these are some, some advantages of robotics. So lastly, a word about the national list of essential SST products. See, depending, based on the ICMR proposal, uh, uh, sorry, WHO initiative, ICMR has proposed a list of essential SST products, or it is also called the priority SST products. So they have prepared a list of appliances which have to be mandatorily made available in various health care centers. The, our health care centers are divided into four categories. The health and wellness centers or the primary health centers, community health centers or subdivision of Taluk hospitals, and then the district level hospitals are there, tertiary care centers are there. So there are specific items to be kept or to be made available, mandatorily made available in each of these uh, health uh, uh, centers. And, uh, it includes appliances for locomotor, visual, and hearing impaired. The list almost all commonly used as TV devices. And uh, I had an opportunity to go to go through this list, which were uh, some 349 items were there in the list. And uh, there were very useful items, and as well as there were many items which are rarely or very, very, very rarely used. So the, the list originally prepared by somebody who did not have much idea regarding the need of the disabled individuals or the proportionate need of the individuals. They have made the list and uh, so many people have made uh, suggestions to improve it and I have also given my own recommendations for improving it. And the probably the ICMR may approve some of the suggestions and come out with a, 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 a more useful, effective list. Then lastly, the changes in the for the advance in the social approach. So I already told you that the social welfare issue from the, the concept of rehabilitation, disability and rehabilitation has shifted from, the, from a simple social welfare issue to a humanitarian issue. And the idea now is to give maximum social integration and participation. Earlier we used to isolate the disabled individuals into separate orphanages, separate uh, uh, homes. Mm -hmm care homes for different types of disability and all. But now the, the, the thought is that as far as possible, these persons with the disability should be integrated in the family, in the same society in which they are born. So that is maximum social integration and participation. And they reduce the role of special care homes and special schools. That is the concept now. Then it is intended to provide equal opportunity to disabled in all aspects of life, in all walks of life, they should be treated as, in, as uh, equal as anybody else. And it is also uh, try, trying to eliminate all sorts of discrimination. And uh, the, the change in the name itself is a, it, uh, shows the various changing concepts. Earlier, these people were the persons with the disability were called the handicapped individuals. That is where the Handicapped Development Corporation and all came into existence. Then they were designated as disabled individuals. Then, then they were designated as persons of the special needs. And then they were 
tamed as patients or individuals with a, or differently abled individuals and now they are being designated as divya nyan having divya or uh, holy appendages or holy organs divya nyan so that is the change in concept in the social approach and thank you thank you for the patient hearing and now you have any if anybody has any doubt or any want any clarification you may please ask nobody wants to ask anything okay then we will wind up travel and what is going to say we'll get to the questions now we can answer okay bye Thank you everyone for your patient hearing and uh, I think you are very much informative and informative.
Ben Data 
Seventy five people so far submitted. Others, please make it fast. The second speaker is ready now. Please send the question link. Question link or no data? Can the mute it? Mute it. The speaker is waiting now. Another five minutes more. Sir, video on. Video. 
രമേശൻ ജി വീഡിയോ നമുക്ക് അണാക്കാം അണാക്കുമ്പോ ഞാൻ പറയാം ഉച്ചയ്ക്ക് ശേഷം ഫോട്ടോ സെഷൻ ഫോട്ടോ എടുക്കാൻ വേണ്ടിയിട്ടാണ് അയച്ചു കൊടുക്കാൻ വേണ്ടിയിട്ടാണ് വീഡിയോ ആണാക്കാൻ പറയുന്നത് ഇപ്പൊ ആണാക്കണ്ട ഉച്ചയ്ക്ക് ശേഷം നമുക്ക് ആണാക്കാം ക്ലിയർ ഇല്ല രമേശൻ ജനറേറ്റർ കണക്ട് ചെയ്ത് വിടാം Yeah. Uh-huh. 